Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me again. Today is a very important day. It's my Happy third birthday, anniversary birthday, of getting a tricky house to me. I often call it my third anniversary to life because, well, without getting a tracheostomy, I would not be here today. So, welcome to my grand celebration. As you can see, I have all these lovely birthday cards and, of course, lovely birthday crown. But when you're celebrating, you need to go beg. So, who needs that paper thing when you can get this big, beautiful, golden crown? Voila! Let's see. <laughs> go. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it pretty? So thank you for joining me and today I'll be discussing briefly my uh, journey to getting a tracheostomy and um, how it went from just simple breathing issues to being full respiratory failure. But before we begin, I'm going to quick take this off because it's lovely but very heavy. <laughs> so my journey started when I was eight years old. I was having issues breathing. I was having problems when I was um, dancing and when I was doing different activities that I just could not breathe. So I went to my pediatrician and he just said, oh, it's asthma. Take this little inhaler, uh, take one puff if you can't breathe, take one more puff, you know, take two puffs whenever you can't breathe uh, and your symptoms will go away. So I tried and I tried and I tried. Um, every time I couldn't breathe, I took a puff, nothing ever worked. Of course, I thought it was just me. I thought, well, I have asthma. I'm just not taking the medicine right. I just ignored all the symptoms and I just continued on. As I became a teenager, it continued to get worse. It continued to feel like I was breathing through a plastic bag. I just couldn't get a breath in. And I thought, well, everybody, everybody has these issues. Um, everybody's short of breath when they exercise and when they do sports. I'm just like everybody else. I didn't think anything of it. Uh, when I was having a lot of health issues in 2008, um, I noticed my breathing was getting more and more severe, very, very short of breath. And in 2009, I had a lot of health issues. And one of the first things I was complaining about was my chest was hurting and I was very short of breath. So my primary physician uh, uh, sent me over to a pulmonologist. She ordered some lung function tests. Um, when I was doing the lung function test, again, very short of breath. I passed out multiple times. The respiratory therapist was very concerned because this was not a normal reaction to having lung function tests done. People just don't pass out when they're trying to do these lung function tests. But again, I just completed them. I did my follow-up with the uh, pulmonologist and she told me, well, these are very odd results. I'm not sure what to make of them, but because they're so odd and you're young, clearly the only explanation for this is you are faking the results and you are an illicit drug user that's what's causing all your symptoms and i was just devastated i almost cried right there on the spot i couldn't believe this here i am trying to get answers trying to seek medical help and this lady is just saying i'm a drug addict um i just left her office i never returned um, several months later, I was diagnosed with a different condition called pastoral epistatic tachycardia syndrome, which is abbreviated POTS. And just briefly, that uh, happens uh, whenever I stand up, my heart rate goes very, very fast. And then when I sit back down and lie back down, my heart rate resumes back to normal. So I was told because when I stand up, my heart rate goes fast, that's causing my fast breathing and that's causing all my breathing difficulties. I really wanted to believe that. I really, really wanted to believe that, but it didn't make sense in my brain because Whenever I was up and about, yes, I would get very short of breath. I would uh, try to lay down. I would still be very short of breath, very, um, just very weak. I couldn't catch my breath. If something was not right, and that would last for hours and hours and hours. Um, so I just went with it, and I just thought, okay, I'm just exaggerating these symptoms. That's not that bad. In 2010, an interesting thing happened. I had GI failure, so they gave me an intestinal feeding tube. Uh, the interesting thing with that is you can't lie flat when having a feeding tube, so I always had to sleep partially propped up on pillows because if you lie flat, all the contents from your GI tract will just spill all over. Uh, it's not pleasant. So you have to constantly try to stay upright to keep everything flowing in your GI tract. Um, so I had the GI tube uh, the J tube until uh, 2013. Um, when 2013, I was able to get it out, but again, I wasn't actually able to get the uh, hole fixed because I had damaged my intestines. It left a hole in my intestines that went to the outside. All my intestines junk. Ugh, it was all over the place. <laughs> so I kept it bandaged. I couldn't lay flat either until they did a surgery about 15 months later. They finally was able to go in 
repair my intestines and get that all fixed. So finally, 2014, I was like, I can lie flat. How wonderful. I wanted to lie flat for so long. So I try to lie flat and I just don't feel well when I lie flat. I'm just, just feel very awful, very yucky. And my body's like, don't lie flat, don't lie flat. So I, I don't lie flat. And then finally one day I'm just like, you know what? I really want to sleep lying flat. So I go, I lie flat about a half an hour after uh, falling asleep. I abruptly just wake up. Oh my gosh, I can't breathe. I, I bolt upright and I scream because I'm just terrified and I'm just gasping for breath, trying to breathe, trying to breathe. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is not good. But again, I don't figure out that it's my breathing. That's the problem. I just know I can't lie flat. So since 2014, I've never uh, didn't lie flat anymore. I just uh, kept being propped up in pillows when I slept and this resolved the issue. I never, you know, had issues with waking up like that when I couldn't breathe. Um, this continued until uh, February 2016. I abruptly had really severe chest pain. I thought, oh no, my POTS, this is my POTS. It must be getting bad. I'm short of breath. Um, I need to get somebody to help me out. Um, during this time, I had um, stopped seeing doctors because I really didn't have a lot of medical issues. My doctors had moved away. I didn't bother getting new doctors because, you know, I was fine. I was, uh, you know, everything was stable. So I tried to get in a new doctor, but again, it was a big, long, drawn out process. Uh, she couldn't see me till November. And I was like, oh, this is February. I, I don't want to wait till November. Um, you know, my symptoms aren't that bad. If I have issues, I'll try to get some help someplace else. So again, I just pushed through, pushed through. In August of 2016, I was at Sunday school talking with a lady and I just talked to her for five minutes. And then I was like, oh, I, I've got to put my head down. I'm just going to pass out. I feel awful. So for Sunday school, I just kept my head down and just was trying to breathe and was just very upset because I, I couldn't breathe and I, I had chest pain. Um, so I, I got through Sunday school and then was driving home and I remember just praying to God saying, God, I know this is a chronic progressive disease. I know this mitochondrial disease. Uh, it's going to one day probably kill me. And I know this is the beginning of the end. I just knew it. And I was just crying and crying and crying. It was so sad. And I was just, I just did not want to face this issue with trying to get my uh, breathing resolved. Um, so I, I continued to try to fight through it. I continued to just sleep um, um, propped up in pillows. I did very little during the day. I just couldn't breathe. And finally, uh, November 1st of 2016, I went to the emergency room because I was terribly frightened. My chest just hurt. I thought, I was going to die. It was just exploding in pain. They did all these tests and they said, everything's fine with your heart. There's nothing wrong with your heart, except I had a very, very high heart rate and I couldn't, I was just gasping for breath. But again, I was assured everything was fine. Um, by this time I was like, I, I need to see a primary care physician. I need to see somebody. So I was able to get a primary care physician uh, appointment. I saw this woman. I've never saw, saw her before. She's very kind, very nice. Said, we need to do lung function tests. So I did lung function tests. And again, it was the same experiments. I was trying to breathe and trying to do these lung function tests and I kept passing out and passing out and passing out and it took forever to do the testing and the respiratory therapist was like, are you a really heavy smoker? Uh, and I was like, no, I don't smoke. And he's like, these results are horrible. I was like, um, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, I was trying to not let his words penetrate my brain, but I was thinking, um, no, I, I'm sure they're not that bad. I'm, I'm sure it's fine. So I go two weeks later for my follow-up, my doctor, and she assures me, oh, they're not that bad. Your forced vital capacity is at 20%. So my lung capacity was at 20%. She assured me that was fine. That wasn't any issue of concern. I just had asthma. Again, here's an inhaler. Take the inhaler. I'll be feeling better very soon. I tried taking the inhaler. I felt awful. I couldn't breathe. I would take the inhaler. I couldn't breathe. It was the same thing that I had when I was eight years old. Um, and so I tried to push through it and just thought, okay, I'm just making this up. I just have asthma. And two weeks later, I remember I abruptly woke up one morning and I couldn't breathe. I was just shaking. I was sweating. I thought I was going to pass out. I just couldn't breathe. And I called the clinic and I was like, there's something wrong, something wrong. Um, my doctor was not in the clinic that day, but they were able to have me see um, one of her colleagues. So I went in so one of her colleagues immediately they're like you need to go to the hospital you need to uh you know be admitted so they immediately called over to the hospital i got admitted uh, once i was there they put me on a machine called bipap i'm sure many of you are familiar with machines um called cpap which cpap and bipap are pretty much the same thing they're a little bit different i'm not going to explain the differences um but basically when you're on the machine 
you have a, a giant uh, mask that you wear. So uh, you wear that. Um, most of the time you just wear it uh, when you're sleeping. Uh, you wear it uh, and then you have a little device that's bedside like that and it has all your settings. Um, so you just wear the mask at night and um, it helps you. It provides high pressure to get lung or get air into your lungs and then you just breathe out um, through the mask. And so that's what I did. So I got fitted for the for the BiPAP and was told wear it at night. Uh, two weeks later I had a follow-up appointment. Um, the doctor just said wear it at night anytime you can't uh, breathe. So I thought oh okay you know if I can't breathe in the daytime, I can also wear it. Oh, that's wonderful because I was having problems during the day breathing. Then he also told me, well, because you have mitochondrial disease, you have uh, muscle weakness. In a year, you're going to need a tracheostomy. You're going to need a ventilator. I uh, looked at the man and I was like, uh, no, no, you must be mistaken. I'm not going to need a ventilator. No, 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 I'm feeling better. I have this BiPAP machine. I'm feeling much better. My breathing's better. But he was so um, adamant that I was in need of ventilator and tracheostomy. He actually had a form uh, printed up and that said I was in need of tracheostomy and ventilator in a year. And I had to sign it um, saying that in a year when I would need it, I would go get the procedure done. So I signed it, but I was like, you can just shred that. You can burn it. I'm never, ever, ever going to need a tracheostomy. No, 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 no. Uh, he also did a very kind thing. He referred me on to a pulmonologist. So in February of 2017, I saw a pulmonologist. Uh, he uh, just kind of looked at my results again. He just ordered more more testing done to see uh, how my breathing was And then I noticed uh, when I was going home on my paperwork. It said diagnosis respiratory failure I would just like to say that was probably one of the most devastating diagnoses I've ever gotten I thought I'm having problems breathing but respiratory failure that sounds very serious that sounds like I could possibly die from that um, so I was very upset by that but my breathing was getting very, very severe. I was using the BiPAP 24 seven. I um, really couldn't do much. I couldn't even like eat because I had to take the mask off to eat and drink and I just couldn't breathe without it. So I was just opting not to eat or drink because I needed to breathe. Um, I was not sleeping very well at night. I would fall asleep for an hour or two hours, wake up drenched in sweat and just my heart would be racing and I'd be dizzy and with a headache and thought I was in a vomit and it was just awful. But I assured myself, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I followed up with my um, physician uh, pulmonologist in March and he had mentioned that I was probably going to need to get a tracheostomy and a ventilator. And I was thinking to myself, um, not now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I, I'm not breathing well, but I'm fine. I'm, I'm really, I'm fine. I, I can get through this. It's just a little breathing difficulty. But again, he said, this is something we're going to have to look at and probably have to do. And I was thinking, oh, we still got a lot of months. You know, it's it's only March. I won't need one till December. That's what my primary care physician said is December. So um, I kind of, again, kind of kept brushing this off. And so when I was uh, trying to wait for my April follow-up appointment, everything was getting very severe. I was only breathing or only sleeping about an hour a night. Um, everything was chaos. I had horrible headaches. I couldn't follow conversations anymore. I was always in a bad mood. It just felt like the world was going to end any moment. I was just so sick all the time. I thought I was going to throw up and I was, it was just, it was awful. It was a mess. And I was just constantly on the verge of tears because I was just, I felt so awful. I couldn't leave my bed. Um, just everything was bad. And during this time, I just kept praying to God, okay, God, I know I should need a tracheostomy. I know, know I need a ventilator. Please make this clear at my April appointment to my physician that I need this because I don't think I can last that much longer. I'm running out of energy. My body is just exhausted. I'd just be shaking because I was just so tired. Um, so in April, I was waiting and waiting and waiting for this appointment. And finally, the day before the appointment, I get a call and it's the doctor's office. My physician had a change of schedule. My April appointment was canceled. I nearly started crying because I knew if that April appointment was going to be canceled to wait another month, I was not going to make it. There was no way. I, I was so sick. Uh, There's no way I could make it. But even before I could say this to the receptionist, she said, oh, but he has a colleague. His colleague uh, will see you tomorrow. Just come in at your regular appointment time. We'll try to fit you into the schedule. So I went in. I took a couple hours before they were able to um, see me. Um, so by the time I saw the physician, I was exhausted. I was just shaking severely, could barely breathe. I was so tired from waiting um, in the doctor's office, just waiting for the appointment. 
the doctor comes in, he looks at me and I'm just huffing and puffing, trying to breathe with the mask on my face. He tries to ask me things, I have to take the mask off. <gasps> like, you know, it's like, hi, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> we put the mask back on. He just looks at me and goes, I'm going to be right back. Uh, what I didn't know is he took his cell phone out, called my pulmonologist and just cursed him out and saying, this girl has respiratory failure. She needs a tracheostomy now. She needs to be in a ventilator. She is, you know, on the verge of death. Um, so he comes back and basically reiterates everything to me, just says, um, you're a respiratory failure. You need to get to the hospital right now. You need a tracheostomy right now. You need to be started on a ventilator. You are going to die if you don't have this done. And I look at the physician going, well, this is an answer from God, but uh, I'm not ready at the moment to do this procedure. I knew I was exhausted. I knew I needed it, but... I needed time. My parents were going out of town the very next day. They were going to be gone for a week. I did not want to go into the hospital, have the procedure done, be there all by myself. Uh, you just never want to be in the hospital by yourself, uh, not when you're having something major done. Um, so I just said, please, please, please let me go home. Um, we'll, we'll do the procedure once my parents get back from their trip. He did not want me to do that. We kind of argued for a while as much as I could argue, trying not to, trying to breathe and everything. So finally he lets me go home. I have the uh, I have the procedure set up for about 10 days later. Um, during this period, I am just begging God, like, please, God, if there's any other way, please show me what I need to do. And everything just kept saying, you need to tracheostomy, you need to tracheostomy, you need to tracheostomy. And so I just kept playing, oh, God, God, is this really the, what you want? You know, I, I don't want to not do what you want me to do. And I was just begging him for anything. So finally, May 3rd, uh, 2017 came. It was the day for my procedure. I remember that drive to the hospital and just continually begging God, if I'm not supposed to have this, please let me know I'm not supposed to have this procedure done. So we get to the um, the, the pre-op and they're setting me up and they're trying to do an IV and this wonderful sweet nurse comes over and she's trying to talk to me, do my IV and I am just gasping for air. I'm just barely breathing, so tired. And she's trying to ask me questions and again, I'm just like, oh, okay, you know, and just huffing and puffing in my mask. And she's just like, oh, oh, um, you uh, don't take that mask off. No, please keep it on, keep it on. Don't, I'll just ask you questions. Say yes with your head or no, <laughs> don't speak because you, you, I don't want you to stop breathing on me. Um, just her words, her reaction were the very words and reaction that I needed uh, to know that this was my only option. Not only was this my only option, I needed it that day, right then, right there, right now. Um, so I was very grateful for her and for uh, just her kindness. It was just really the sign that I needed that I couldn't survive. And I was so tired, so exhausted. And I just knew, actually, if I didn't have that done that day, if I would have had to wait one more day, I don't think I would have been living. I was just too exhausted, too tired. So I remember uh, going back to the operating theater and I just had this tremendous calm and this tremendous peace knowing that this was the right thing to do, that this is exactly what God wanted me to do. And I just knew whatever happened, this was it. Like if I made it through the procedure, I would have a brand new life. This life I was living was going to be dead, was going to be gone. And if I didn't make it through the procedure, it didn't matter because there was no way I was going to continue on. So I had the procedure done. Uh, I woke up on the other side of the procedure was the first time, I mean, after an hour of the procedure, I woke up still under the anesthesia, but it was the first time I had so much energy. I could see, I everything was like a brand new life. I could hear people talking. I could understand conversations. The headache was gone. The brain fog was gone. Oh my goodness, it was amazing. Um, and I just remember being so excited, so thrilled. And I was like, for once, you know, my life was kind of back to what it was a couple years ago. Um, and it was just amazing to just, not have to be forcing myself to constantly breathe. Um, so kind of an interesting thing that when I um, woke up from, from the procedure, I was very, very happy and very, very joyful. So this is me after the procedure. Yay, I'm still kind of very drugged. Um, but one of the things that they told me I couldn't do is they told me I, I couldn't swallow until I got the swallowing test. So it took a couple of days before they were comfortable that I could swallow. So I passed the swallowing test, and the very first thing I did was I drank a Synergy uh, Kombucha. So I just love Synergy Kombucha, and it's just always been a wonderful, joyful thing. So anytime I'm like feeling down or sad, I just always bring up Synergy Kombucha because it always reminds me of having the tracheostomy procedure done and just my newness and my joy to life. Um, and so that's my story of um, getting the tracheostomy, and so in celebration of my third tracheostomy uh, anniversary.
here's some synergy, right? Um, so here's to uh, to this year, to my third year with a tracheostomy, and to uh, a brand new life that I'm living. So thank you for joining me, and thank you for this wonderful, glorious celebration. And um, I hope to see you again next time. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye.